October 1st meeting of the Montpelier Design and Review Committee. I will let committee members and staff introduce themselves. Hannah Smith. Meredith Crandall, staff. Stephen Everett. Eric Gilbertson. Benjamin Cheney. We are an advisory committee to the Development Review Board. We will hear the applications for the projects that are listed on the agenda. And speaking of which, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. I second. All in favor of the agenda, raise your hand. Agenda is approved. And we can go to a person for the first application is not here. So we can go to item number seven. There, two others are continued. And we'll go to number seven, downtown light poles and wayfinding master plan for my Pelier Alive. Come forward, have a seat, introduce yourself. Dan Grover from Mount Pelier Alive, and I'm going to call in to um, John Seeley, who's the consultant we've been working with on the wayfinding plan, if I may. And while Dan's doing that. I, I would like to separate the banners from the wayfinding discussion. Okay, we could probably, I mean, it's in presentation banners is last, so we could probably do those for however you want to do it. I just, I just okay. want to separate yeah. the two. Okay. Um, and just to note that this is informal review because these. Ooh, it's loud. <laughs> Hello, this is John. Hey, John, it's Dan Groberg, and you're here with the Design Review Committee. Hello, hi, Dan. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, so this is an informal review because this neither of these projects actually need a zoning permit, um, but we're bringing it before the design review to get input. Yes, we certainly welcome any feedback. Um, John, uh, just uh, I have the presentation. Oh, I should get it oh. actually on the screen would help. Um, okay. And uh, I guess if you want to just tell me when you're ready to move on to the next slide, I'm happy to do that. Sure. Um, how much time do we have? I just want to make sure that we're not uh, going yeah. over. I, I mean, I think we want to keep it relatively brief because they do have a big project to discuss after us on the agenda. Okay. Um, That's why I asked. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So give us just a couple of minutes because the projector has to warm up. Sounds good. Great. Okay. You might need to adjust your sizing just a little bit. Has, has leaf pop again. peeping season started yet up in Montpelier? Yes. We're not uh, quite peak foliage yet, but uh, let's see if I can. I think you have to change the size on that. Before, before we start, uh, Dan, can you give us some idea of where this project is in the process? Yes. Um, that's going to be as good as it's going to be, but you have it in your packet. Um, yes, so we have uh, received uh, approval from the state TIC uh, for the project, which is a requirement for um, the driver signage, vehicular signage. Um, and we've received approval uh, for the plan from city council. Um, and I'll note that um, what we're looking for is feedback on the design elements and that it um, is not final um, in terms of the specific uh, signs uh, or their specific placement. So uh, we look forward to continuing to work with various stakeholders uh, to in, uh, ensure that we have, um, you know, exactly the, the wording on the signs pointing to the venues that we want to point to in the locations. Uh, we plan to continue to work on that. Um, there may or may not be the opportunity to add signs based on budgetary uh, restraints um, and uh, I'll add to that that we are on the vehicular signage um, very limited by the state regulations um, specifically in terms of having no more than three messages on any given sign um, so that was a big constraint that we had in terms of how many um, landmarks that we could point to um, we are intending to put this project out for bid later in October um, to apply for a state grant in the spring um, and hopefully to have the signage up by the end of 2019 
if all goes according to plan. Um, so with that introduction, John, take it away. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I know the general sequence of the presentation, Dan, but maybe you can clue me in as to the pages as, as you guys flip through them. Yeah. Um, but I guess we'll start with the overall goals and objectives to the project. Um, as we started this project with um, Montpelier Alive uh, uh, two years ago, actually, um, the, the goals really haven't changed. Um, the intention is to provide a consistent vehicle and pedestrian and visitor wayfinding experience for the capital city, uh, for visitors and uh, travelers alike, um, and for residents. Um, to really create a sense of place and create a consistent um, sign language within downtown area. Um, and then, you know, it, it's really meant to reinforce and um, provide better direction to all of the parking areas as well as the destinations downtown, supporting the cultural institution. And that's really kind of the big picture. Now, the design and everything that's taken place since then um, has been about choosing materials, typography, um, working with the TIC on the METCD requirements that Dan uh, briefly touched on earlier, um, making sure that we're compliant with um, all those requirements, uh, and then also working on the pedestrian side to make sure that we have information and direction for, for those who have parked and are walking and exploring downtown to um, take advantage of all the retail <coughs> as well as the cultural destinations <coughs> downtown. Now, the, 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 in terms of the big picture on the design, the idea here is that we're creating a sense of place as well, is that we're adding to what is already <coughs> part of the, the cultural equity of Montpelier um, by creating a really sophisticated and um, you know positive design that um, is positive to the architecture in downtown as well as the streetscape. So uh, the the you can keep flipping, Dan. I'm not there, but I kind of know basically what happens here. I think um, we first took a big picture outline of all the different sign types, all the diagrams that. You're, you're probably seeing right now, um, that outline all the, the kid parts, basically. It's the family of sign types, and they all should have a certain similarity in terms of design and typeface, but there's a hierarchy that starts from um, a gateway, which we've identified at Main and Route 2, um, leading into downtown, and then a, a hierarchy based on vehicle signs and pedestrian signs and information signs as well as signs that support the bike system. Um, so that page you're looking at is really just a diagram of all the elements. Um, what's after that, Dan? I'm sorry. Um, the sign message hierarchy, districts, public spaces, nonprofit institutions, shops. And yeah, houses. so um, part of what the TIC requirements are in the, in the Vermont statute is that <clears throat> these public wayfinding signs for the vehicles um, cannot have any private institutions or private businesses listed, only nonprofit organizations and cultural institutions, government buildings, and so forth, which is fine because that's really what the system is trying to do downtown. So we, when we presented to the public two years ago, we vetted this through... Um, Small Business Association downtown. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right, correct name for it. I, I can't remember. But that, that was the uh, <clears throat> one of the groups we met with. And uh, the idea behind the, the way this system supports not only the public but also the private is that at the pedestrian level, at the kiosk level, we're able to create a map potentially with some zones for retail and businesses that could be updated within a reasonable time period um, because those businesses and those and those institutions cannot be listed in the um, in the vehicle sites so that slide you're looking at starts to set up that hierarchy 
of what we do with the vehicle signs and what message comes before which one and what that hierarchy is. Um, and as Dan mentioned, we are limited to about three messages per the METCD. Um, so that has not been a problem. We've had to leave off some, some institutions from the messaging hierarchy because of that requirement. But in general, we've been able to accommodate the vast majority of, of, um, of the cultural stuff. You can probably move on. Um, yeah, we're on the, to the sign Montpelier type. Live brand page. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> this is a program extension of Montpelier Live, and we want to make sure that it also has that, it, it relates to, you know, the economic development portion of, of Montpelier um, and what Montpelier Live is doing for the community. Um, right at, about at the time when we started this project, they had just completed a branding exercise um, of which we um, kind of folded into our design by using this kind of sort of multifaceted um, state house image with a color palette. And we kind of tweaked it and played with it and made it a little more abstract. And that, that becomes a part of the backside and um, certain parts of both the vehicle and the pedestrian signs, as you'll you'll see in the design coming up. Um, We've moved on to these sign, look, sign type families. Where, where would these yeah. uh, uh, Montpelier Live brand signs be used? Uh, well, you see the branding represented on the um, throughout the design language of the signs. So if you're on, we're on page nine now, which is the sign type family, you'll see um, on the back of the vehicular signage and the bottom of the information and pedestrian signages, uh, you'll see that sort of abstract state house with the color palette that was developed through the branding process represented on the sign. But it's a different color palette right. that you're showing us here. It's, um, it's inspired by the color palette and we have a simplified logo that has a so the, the colors are from among that group family. But those colors are radically different than these colors. They're, they're actually taken from among the... the from the bottom of the eye? It, yeah, we, we have a, a... Branding people gave us a, a, a group of colors, a palette of colors, and yeah. that does that so inspired the design. They may not be the exact same colors, but the, the abstract state house and the... Um, yes. Is the palette going to be used throughout? The palette will be used uh, throughout. Uh, as you can see, the um, different signs have some different coloring right. to them. Um, and you'll also see once we get to the banners, which I understand that Eric wants to keep that separate, but that same language plays to the uh, light pole banners as well. Dan, you could probably fast forward to page um, 14, and that'll kind yes. of support what you just mentioned. Um, you can't really see up yeah, there, but I can see it right there, I yeah, yeah. So on page fourteen, it shows the color palette that we're using. Um, yes, and those were inspired by colors in those. In you, the you, you don't have any samples of those that uh, are not come out. Don't come off a printed a color printer. I do not. I'm just. I'm looking for the accurate representation of the colors. Yeah, well, we'll we'll get into that once we get a fabricator on board. There'll be a whole set of material submittals and samples that we're going to review. But the idea is that the back of the sign will have one of these six sort of color palettes with a ghosted state house on there at the front. Correct. In some cases. Yeah, front bottom. Okay. Yep. Yes. Would also encourage wherever those signs are placed to be respective of the buildings and or environment they are in as far as coordinating the colors so that you're not clashing. Yeah, certainly to the extent possible. Um, obviously specific stores may change, of, you know, the lifespan of this signage hopefully will be long. Um, I'm Hopefully, the life of the you, stores will be long as well. If you've got a brick building yes. that's there for 100 years, you're not going to put a baby blue sign next to the brick, which contrasts with it. It's not, it's not a compatible color. Yeah, we can certainly account for that where possible. 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure how it's being projected in your screen there, but the palette is actually all very muted and it's intended to be organic, natural in color. So there's, there's no baby blues or pop colors. Um, sometimes that gets misrepresented in projections, I've noticed in presentations. Um, that might be a reaction going on. Can you, can you speak to the pedestrian directional? I don't understand where that would be. And is it touching the ground? Um, yes. Yeah, John, do you want to talk about that? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it touches the ground. It's got a frame that goes across the bottom edge, bolted into the ground, and then up on one side and the other. Um, so it's open in the center of that, but it's fully um, attached on both sides. Much like the M, that line that drops down is a piece of some sort of flat stock that attaches to the ground. So, so might want to go to slide 17 or page 17 on the handout. Yeah. Because that has a good couple of pictures. Oh, so it's it's open. It's it, there are sort of legs on both sides and then open in the oh, yes open on. Yeah, it's a thick it's a thick fabricated aluminum footing basically. Okay, I get it. There again, that's a perfect example. Hopefully, the colors are off from what the actuals are going to be, particularly in those two locations <laughs> that are exhibited on 17. I, I, the, one of the things I think people really like to see in downtown is to be able to figure out where you are. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if some of these uh, graphics couldn't be substituted for a map with a you are here. Sure. So the informational kiosks will have a well, map with the you are here. Maybe even, you know, maybe even more than that. I, I spent quite a bit of time with this, and I, I, I honestly couldn't figure everything out. But that may be me. Uh, may not. Uh, uh, the. I think any time I've been in a strange community, I like to know where I am and be able to orient myself to where things are. I, I, I've told several people, Seattle, I think I had the coolest one was they had the sewer covers on the uh, on the sidewalk uh, were cast with a map and then they had a little uh, brass pin that was drilled in there so you could just look down at the sewer cover and figure out where you were. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think those directional things uh, so that people can look and, and find out where they are, where they're going, uh, otherwise you're just kind of left out there with a bunch, a bunch of signs. Yeah. Have you studied the uh, location plans by any chance? I've looked at them. Uh, yeah, there's just a lot of science to try to figure out. Uh, uh, in, in my well, opinion, they're all they're labeled by sign type, and they're they're pretty closely located. They've been vetted through DPW um, in the planning. Um, there are three. We didn't feel like we needed more than three major points for a kiosk um, that would give you a map on both sides, and then <clears throat> and then. Intermediate to that would be the pedestrian signs, uh, which you just saw renderings of, and then um, above that would be the the directional signs, which are the the highest quantity of signs. They're all pretty clearly labeled on those drawings. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I worry some about the content and the number. It just seems like a large volume. This is uh, for basically I, a four-block section of. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking at it, like, to come. <laughs> that seven, mass one, two, makes three, it look. Four, five, six, seven, eight, eight on one side of the street in, uh, you know, two block. So, John, he's looking at page 20, 23 from um, and referring to State Street. Um, yeah, and so those are different. Um, some of those are different. I types understand. Of They're different ele different and elevations. Yeah, um, and, like and some of them are replacing some signs that are there currently. Um, so, for instance, this will replace existing parking signage. 
um, that's there. So some of it is, and um, uh, some bike signage may be replacing like existing bike signage. So um, it, I, I would say that it seems like more signs than it will feel like in reality. Do you have anything to add to that, John? Yeah, I mean, what you're looking at um, are three different sign types that are all in green. There's the B1s, the B2s, and the B3s. Um, the B1s are the vehicle direction signs. The B2s are the uh, pedestrian signs, um, of which there was only a handful of. The, um, and then there's the parking signs that are only located at the entrances to parking um, locations. So um, I think what might be throwing everyone off is <clears throat> the size of the bubbles um, in scale to the uh, map itself. It looks like they're, you know, all within three feet of each other, but yeah. they're actually quite spread out. Um, and they're only placed at major decision points for vehicles and weight and, and pedestrians. Um, so they're, they're really only where they need to be um, and not in any kind of redundant fashion. Uh, I mean, I'm going to say again, I think having a lot of maps of the downtown particularly uh, with things labeled, whether it's parking uh, and the major points that you're pointing to, the State House, I think that could be done very nice graphically with an image of the State House or an image of the streetscape uh, as you've done here so people can really figure out where they are and what they're looking at. Sure. Yeah. One, one comment that I made uh, to the city council when I was considering this is that the uh, information on the historic district be included in this uh, designation on maps. Uh, I think there could be some informational signs about the history of downtown Montpelier. People are interested in that. I think the department... Yeah, we, we actually haven't gotten into designing the actual kiosks. We're still in the stage of budgeting this project and um, locating the sign types. So, for instance, with the kiosk, it's a two-sided sign. It could have, you know, the map has not been designed yet. The visual of the streetscape has not been um, developed, uh, will be, uh, as well as potentially any accompanying interpretive information about the history or... You know, there's all kinds of opportunities on that sign which really haven't been developed yet. We're at that stage now where we have to figure out what we can afford and how we're going to do it. John, it might be helpful if you could speak briefly to your credentials and what other wayfinding projects you've worked on. Uh, okay. Uh, the City of Providence, City of Worcester, currently working with the City of Barrington, Rhode Island. Um, Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts, um, and a lot of other campuses, college campuses. Why, is there a question right now? Or? I, 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 I say that just to say that we, you know, chose you because you have done this before and um, have a lot of experience with wayfinding systems. So just for the committee to understand that this is based on best practices and and things that have been successful in other communities. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but I, I do want to stress that, you know, the map hasn't been designed yet. There's not um, a final illustration that uh, would probably answer some of the questions I heard earlier. Um, this is still at schematic level in terms of the design. Um, there's a package that we're going to have to develop that will include all the artwork. Um, and I don't really know what the process is going to be in Montpelier, and that's really up to Dan and, and the committee to, to figure out what, how they want to proceed. But it's done in different ways in different places. Um, so far, all of the messaging has been vetted through um, the planning office uh, with, um, uh, with Corey Line and myself. Corey's uh, in public which, you know, Dan, I think you've weighed in on it a little bit. But... Um, so, you know, that isn't, like as Dan mentioned earlier, is not set in stone. So none of this is really set in stone other than the design that we'd like to get approved. <coughs> I, I, 
without uh, some of this other stuff, I find it hard to develop an uh, opinion uh, based on not specifics. What, what, what's the plan for continuing the development of this? Yeah, so um, there's a wayfinding committee that's been developed that will continue working on this. Um, we'd be happy to continue um, getting input from Design Review. Um, as Meredith mentioned, this project is not subject to approval by the Design Review Committee, um, both because it's within the city's public right of way and because it's considered a public art project. But you're looking for schematic. We, we would schematic love your feedback. We right. love your feedback um, in any way, and we'll, we'll certainly try to incorporate it where possible into the project. Who was on the wayfinding committee? Uh, John could probably speak better to that because it was actually all almost all developed before I started as director. Okay. Um, the Montpelier Business Association, uh, a member of the Montpelier Live Board, uh, Corey Lyon from Public Works. Um, I. I can tell you, you who else. You I'm not looking at you. Yeah. I'm looking at the phone. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> John, okay, like, you John at you, can you, <laughs> do you remember who else has been involved in the process? Yeah, uh, we had a representative from um, the VCFA, uh, Greg Gossens, who's a board member, architect and designer. All were very positive and very supportive of this. Um, uh, I'm very national as well, the idea. but I, and I don't I don't remember her name. She hasn't been involved in over a year. Um, and um, Ashley, who's no longer with the organization, this is pretty typical to be at this stage right now, where we have basically created a package that is ready to go to bid for budgeting purposes. In other words, um, our next step is to make sure that we can secure the money to fund it. Um, all the final artwork, the messaging, you know, the design of the backside of the signs, the color selection, all of those things will happen once we have that contract with the fabricator. Um, but we won't get that contract with the fabricator until we get through the next phase. So of, you know, of fundraising and um, developing the final documents. So that's kind of probably why you're wondering if why isn't everything fully specified. But it's pretty typical at this stage. It goes in phases. Um, so if you, um, <laughs> we've jumped around a little bit, but we were uh, getting to the l landmark, if you want to just introduce that briefly, which is on page 10. Yeah, this went through many iterations. Um, we started with much bigger ideas with the letter M and how we would put that at different gateway uh, locations leading into downtown, um, kind of distilled it down to this one location. Um, also, the TIC doesn't, re doesn't allow anything more than 64 square feet at one location. So um, this is where it's going. This is where we think it should go based on uh, traffic and visitor arrival, uh, and also it's a nice gateway into downtown um, on the memorial side. Uh, so it's a vertical. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry? I didn't say anything, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So it's a uh, vertical landmark that it has a stone base. Um, it would be uh, either internally illuminated or from the ground, and that is to be determined. Um, it would be a subtle glow, if anything, uh, and would be double-sided, uh, can be viewed from both directions, and um, it takes into the same consideration of typography and the material palette, as well as the uh, state house image at the top. Can you speak to the font selection chosen? Yeah. Um, it's a it's a, it's a modern typeface. Um, one of the criteria from well over two years ago when we had we you know we went through a whole design criteria of how to select colors and typography and all that. It all came down to seeing it's the future of Montpelier, not the historical Montpelier. Not that history can't take place; it should, especially on the kiosk potentially some interpretive elements, which we proposed as well earlier on. Um, 
but the image of the wayfinding should be, you know, a um, a more progressive, free uh, kind of uh, future uh, feeling, modern feeling for um, for the city, and you know, pretty much everyone agreed to that. Um, so Futura was the chosen typeface. Um, our representative from uh, VCFA also helped with that selection. What what is VP? FA. VC. 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 Vermont College of Fine Arts. VCFA. Uh, VCFA, the Vermont, Vermont College, College of Fine Arts. Of Fine Arts. Okay. <clears throat> uh, right I have a question. I'm looking at page 11. Uh, uh -huh. There's a picture of the sign with the big red truck in the background. Uh, as far as I can see, that would only be visible as you're coming from Barry, because there's a tree right behind it. Uh, and this picture doesn't have many leaves on it, but it probably does most of the year. Uh, and there's no arrow on it to indicate that downtown Montpelier is a right turn at that point or a left turn if you're coming off the interstate. Uh, I, 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 that, that just strikes me as being not as useful as it could be. Uh, I, I think as far as budgeting is concerned too, I think they're are two primary ways that people get into downtown Montpelier. One is on Main Street, the other is on Bailey, with a, a sort of a third uh, one on Taylor Street. There were additional locations proposed initially. Um, some of them were not approved by the state CIC. Um, and some well, none of them were approved, and also we have to put them on city property if they're not approved by the TIC, and we didn't have those locations. Um, we had several other proposals at one point. This, this plan has come a long way in two years. Um, the landmark will be visible, though, from both directions. To answer your question, I, I understand that it looks like it may not be in that picture, but it will be visible from both directions. Yeah. I, I, I just, it's nice to say that, but I don't see how it can with a, with a tree behind it. I mean, yes, it, when you get right up the intersection, but you have to choose whether you're going to make a left turn at that point or go straight when you can't see the sign. How much time was spent on this, um, on this particular aspect? Of what locating signs? No, the landmark. I guess I, my point is, I just feel like that's a really visually valuable piece of property in Montpelier to be able to create something that is really awesome. Uh, this doesn't feel awesome to me, but I wasn't there as part of the sort of all the time spent on it. So I guess I'm just. I don't feel like so, so there are um, limitations uh, related to the size that it can be um, dictated by the state um, and then it continues the um, sort of language design language of the other signage including the um, cutout lettering you'll find at the top of the pedestrian signage um, in the same font um, and the same um, abstract state house imagery at the top and then utilizing uh, granite-based native materials. Um, so the idea was to continue uh, cohesive language through all of the signage. Um, there's a maximum of, um, what, how many square feet can that sign be? 64. Uh, 64 square feet per face. We had several proposals for that location. I'm certain you did. That's why I just was feeling like it wasn't totally fair for me to say that it wasn't awesome without hearing like all the work that went into creating what is there. I, yeah. I, I want to be clear. I'm very much in favor of the project and having people be able to find their way downtown. I certainly have a lot of questions about it, uh, about its effectiveness uh, as I've expressed for some of them. But I'm, generally in favor of people being able to find their way around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly beyond this, if um, anyone cares to 
submit additional feedback or questions, we can incorporate it as possible. We're happy to look a at lot, any ideas. A lot, of it, a lot of it has to do with specific sign, specific size, specific location, the way it's oriented, so that it's, again, as Eric said, that you're coming uh, down Memorial Drive, you don't see it because the tree's there. Uh, and you don't want people sort of driving in at the last minute, looking at a sign and distracting them from, right. from driving. And in particular, the downtown Montpelier, I, that sign would be more readable if the letters were smaller so that there's more distinction between the background and the yeah. lettering. It's too crowded. Well, also keep in mind that it's not a wayfinding sign. I mean, it, it's a landmark. There are other signs on Memorial as you approach that intersection that are giving you specific destination and turning information. So it's it's not directing you to downtown. Other signs are. Um, it's more of a gateway. Meant to be a landmark. My my assumption is that this is a fairly expensive installation. Yes. Uh, if you have other signs, uh, and I don't think there's a particularly good location for it. If you have other signs and things like that. I, I don't see the need for it. I don't know what information it gives you that you don't or what the attraction is that that's going to get people to turn to downtown Montpelier any more than a sign that, with an arrow that says downtown on it. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Um, are there any other pages that we'd like to review? Otherwise, we'd move on to the banners. I want to be respectful of your time. I think we have one member of the audience who wanted to make a I'd like to make a comment on this contribution. Section. Introduce yourself. Uh, and Steve Whitaker from Montpelier for 30 years or so. Um, I applaud the idea of guiding our visitors. Uh, I would caution that we don't want to, people like to come and shop and be around Montpelier because it doesn't feel like a mall. So we, we want to not create a set of signage that looks like a mall. Um, keep Montpelier peculiar. Uh, I think this is a perfect type project. Right now it seems structured to, they're looking to clear the gate and keep running. And I think this is the kind of project that y'all need to keep a very short leash on and the expertise on this design review committee should have lots of, I know it'll make it harder to quote the price and get the fabricator, but it needs to be restructured such that the design review committee, whether or not the project is exempt from city permits, uh, change the city rule if you have to, to get control of this project in this committee. Thank you. Thank you. One, one thing I wanted to say that uh, it's been emphasized that we have no authority to review this, and I understand the court decision that got us in that position and I find that very difficult to deal with in a number of things. This is, a, this is a project that has a huge amount of impact on downtown Montpelier. Uh, and no matter how it's done. Now the, the, the interpretation from a city attorney a few years ago is, is that these city projects are not reviewed in the city work. My design review educational institutions. This is not directed necessarily to you. It's more at Bill. And <laughs> the, but the, this uh, uh, idea that uh, educational institutions, uh, city property, and churches are not subject to review. Those are the most important landmark buildings in the city. And all these street signs are uh, a very important in in the city. They're they're going to create a huge visual impact, and so I, you know that that I mean I'm sitting here making comments, and uh, I like to be helpful and positive, but uh, I don't see that uh, we have any influence on the outcome. I except in a, in a kind of an informal way of advising you, uh, and. Uh, uh, that's just a comment from from my position is that uh, this is I think this is the first I looked at it the city council 
uh, and this is the first time I've really had a look at this uh, and maybe I missed some opportunities maybe there were some meetings I didn't go to uh, but this is this is a fairly serious undertaking with a lot of visual impact on the downtown and a lot of potential impact on how people get around Montpelier yep. one yeah, of the things I, I noticed is that there's nothing to do with the new transit center the transit center um, was uh, has sort of come to fruition after um, after this process, um, but we hope to be able to add um, some uh, potentially an informational kiosk incorporated um, inside the transit center, um, and uh, potentially also an informational kiosk with the parking garage project. Um, in addition, um, the, there is parking signage that points um, to. The, the garage was already considered for parking signage, um, and uh, we can certainly add um, vehicular and pedestrian signage that relates to the, the transit center. As yeah, that's, I, I, yeah, I understand you weren't in on this project, and I'm asking you questions that, that, no, that's that fine. I'm picking on you. No, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll like just give you a little that. bit of context as well, which is that the um, so this is building on the branding process that Montpelier Life did with the city that had significant public input. Um, throughout the project, um, and then the wayfinding a project itself, the committee has um, held various um, informational and, and feedback sessions with various constituencies and stakeholders, and included um, people from various stakeholders. Um, and it's been presented at city council three times for uh, for feedback. Again, one of the some of the criteria that we deal with projects even though we may not you know vote on this particular project just for our input um, a lot of the criteria that are used to evaluate projects has to do with protecting the historical integrity of the town people come here one of our greatest resources is the historic downtown people come here people come back because they remind it reminds them of the town they used to live in 50 years ago or however long ago and some of the criteria in particular that we use to evaluate a project uh, one here preservation reconstruction of an appropriate historic style if a project's in the historic district also recognition of and respect for view quarters and significant vistas including gateway views of the city and state house so that the only thing that we would be looking for would be if those signs are number one do not clutter up the downtown and and interfere with some of those criteria that we use to judge a project by number one um, and just that it be respectful of the historic downtown we don't want to dilute it so that people don't care because we've screwed it up no and that is certainly not our intention in any way I hate to be you know designing from a point of like concern about bad things happening and being the guy that's like oh what about stickers and graffiti but these things feel like huge flat surfaces that are a lot <laughs> so of that fun. we can actually speak to um, John you were telling me that they're coded in yeah. some way um, <clears throat> they're actually not huge um, in context uh, I know that you don't have these signs up right now but they are within the maximum allowed by the MUTCD and the TIC. Um, now in terms of graffiti, uh, we typically would um, specify an anti-graffiti surface, which is, a, um, which is a, a surface they apply after the, the paint, and that allows for any stickers or spray paint um, to be removed. Uh, we're currently, we currently did that in Providence. Um, it's been very successful. Um, and there's technologies getting better and better every year offered by paint companies. So by the time we get this in a fabrication, we might even have a better um, anti-graffiti coating. But that is, um, that's a question asked by just about any municipality and yeah. has been addressed. I'm certain. I guess who's, who's going to be responsible for maintaining these once they get up? Um, I, I mean, I guess it depends on specifically what you're talking to. It will be some of it will be public works, 
in terms of the updating of any directory signage. Um, we're hoping to do it in a way that doesn't require um, too frequent maintenance. I think we may actually drop the idea of having specific stores listed because that may get um, too difficult to keep updated. Um, but Mom, right. Your Live would play some role in that. Well, a lot of places take have a system so you can update it. That's yeah. one of the questions I so had. So the, the informational kiosk is designed in a way that it would be easy to update which Update an individual correct. listing. Um, maybe not to the individual listing, but there's a um, there are sort of zones that can be pulled out without replacing the entire sign. Yeah, because we, we review enough changes in business locations down here through the signage. Sure. That it happens fairly frequently. Yes, which is why um, we're thinking of moving away from listing specific uh, specific business names on the directory and instead pointing towards business districts on the directory um, because of concern about keeping them updated. In other places, they have been updated twice annually. So that would be the solution uh, if we did. A uh, question. Uh, I'm not sure I'm entirely clear about how these signs are mounted, but the idea of plowing the sidewalks they are compliant with all of Public Works' needs for okay. plowing. Is Public um, Works going to dig them out in the winter when the snow gets deep enough to bury the sign? <laughs> well, the um, pedestrian uh, signage, I think, would be the only, and the informational kiosks would be the only one where that be, would be relevant. They're not within the plow routes. They're beside the plow Correct. sidewalk plow routes. Okay, so they will get buried. I mean, I, I think perhaps the bot very bottom of the sign may have snow, but the relevant information would certainly still be visible. How many of the B1 and B3 locations currently exist? Is there an overlay of location for location, or are these all new locations, B1 and B3? Um, so which one? B1 is vehicle on B3. So it would replace all of the existing parking directional signage. Um, they're currently located at all of the public lots that you might think of. The vehicular directional signage does not. I don't think there's any existing vehicular signage, but you don't hold me to that. <laughs> We're, we intend well, it, to work with. Well, it, it could. The, the, the vehicle directionals um, actually will replace. Some um, could potentially replace some of the bicycle signage because it, uh, it, it, it directs people to the bike trail, which is being, you know, it's under development still, um, and that's, that's part of the system, as well as there's additional parking signs throughout downtown that are on random posts, um, and those would be able to come down as well. So it will consolidate some of the signs. Um, but the majority, obviously, there, there, there is no current wayfinding vehicle sign downtown. Uh, I think the content of this, I'm looking at page 27, and uh, I have never heard in the, cor the uh, lower uh, right corner, I've never heard of the East no, Business District. No, we intend to change that to the River Street, <laughs> River Street <laughs> District. It needs to be labeled as a district. You can't use the name of a specific street. You would have to call it the River Street District, but we do intend to change it to the River Street District. And that's a like a state requirement? That it can't name a specific street. It has okay. to be the district. Right. So that one that was said Barry Street District or whatever, that uh, would be different. Barry Street District can say Barry Street District as long as it says district. It can't just say Barry Street. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, layers and layers of requirements. Don't, uh, yeah, I, I don't the think. The nomenclature you'll figure out as you yes. move on. Correct. Correct. <laughs> And we, there are a few that people have pointed out that would be helpful to add. Um, and if it's possible, you know, it, sometimes it's difficult with where they would be placed, whether or not it could be possible. The vehicular signage in particular has to be located at the point where the driver makes the decision about the turn or not. So for instance, if we wanted there to be a sign that points um, down Barry Street towards the Center for Arts and Learning and the Recreational Center, for instance, if we were coming from Memorial Drive, there may or may not be a location where we could put that sign with enough advance notice for a driver. Um, so that's something that we'll work with Public Works to attempt to try and figure out if possible. Head, heading east on State and just State and Maine, 
that'd be a difficult one because of the you know, current the way the turn lane is set up there, as far as signage is concerned. Yeah, so that we have signage that's appropriately located. You can add it to positive pies structure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I, like I said, I certainly welcome continued feedback from the Design Review Committee. I'm happy to share updated plans as we have them with anyone. If anyone has a particular interest and would like to be more involved, please get in touch with me. Happy to do that. Um, certainly incorporate feedback where, where possible, given budgetary restrictions and the many restrictions that the state has on the vehicular signage in particular. I guess one piece of feedback I would like to offer is that I would like to see the signs. I don't feel like the logo and the color is strong enough, and to see that kind of everywhere, I'd like to see less just surface area. That just keep it to the text and the color, and a lot less just keep it simple. Yeah, a lot less stuff. And sure. The the for whatever that's that's worth, that's fine. That's, um, fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. Fine. I appreciate that. Um, Keep it simple and discreet, as the person <laughs> from the audience said. We don't want it to look like the directions inside of a mall. No, I appreciate that. We also would like okay. to um, incorporate, wherever possible, the visual identity that's that's also used in all of Montpelier Live's um, marketing uh, in locally and out-of-state yeah. marketing that sort of is the Montpelier branding that we're hoping to continue to do even more with, and so to establish a cohesive visual identity for all of you know, when you think about failure, hopefully you will think. I think pe people are more interested in information when they're looking at signs. That the, I encourage you, and I couldn't figure out all what was going on, but whether we have the back of a sign, sometimes it just shows artwork and a logo that maybe you can figure out what kind of information to put there because as people stop by sign on the sidewalk and go on yeah. the other side, uh, I, I always think I'm on the historic preservation Commission, so think about read about the historic district. Uh, say something about the historic oh. buildings, or have a general map that people can refer to to be able to yeah. know where they well, are. Well, our 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 expertise. Okay, so first of all, the sign is eight feet up in the air or taller because there has to be a seven and a half foot clearance by requirement. So everything above the that. So, sign. Um, and, and vehicle signs are only meant to be read one direction or else they can cause traffic accidents. People looking at the backs of signs on the, op on the opposite side of the street. So we don't put information on the back side of the signs um, that's going to be illegible for people driving in the opposite yeah. uh, I, side of the he, road. He was referring to the pedestrian that's a signs. Yeah. The pedestrian signs, the kiosks, uh, I mean, it just, it just, I don't know how conceptual well, or how okay, detailed this is. The, but, uh, right, but okay, but if you look at all the layouts and all the sign locations for the pedestrian signs, there's information on both sides. If you go to so we're not slide putting 33, pictures. Eric, if you go to I'm slide looking 33. at page 17, and there is like the logo at the bottom just taking up yep. space. If you go to 33, they yeah. have specifics. Well, yeah, okay. I mean, I guess that you guys want that. I get that. I'm yeah, so that's the right part of. The branding and the cohesive sense of place and thing. the place making that is okay. I thought you were talking about the vehicle signs because yeah. that's no, we really can't put information that is no. useful on that side. I okay. understand that, uh, but the, any place else where you've got uh, I don't know what FPO stands for. Well, it's on that's page just 33. a um, no, it's for placement only, and it's just um, an artwork. At the stage we're at right now, we haven't actually placed the artwork, so that's just a technical term. Future placement only. But I would encourage that. I wouldn't space. get hung up on that. They, yeah, that, that space be used <laughs> for information <laughs> until it's done. <laughs> so I'd love to move on to the um, banners. If okay, good. You know. yeah. <laughs> and so all of our interest on Yes. Um, yeah, so that is the last page, um, which is page 36 in your packet. Um, so these are uh, street light banners that will be mounted to the existing light poles. Um, they will be manufactured by the same um, design, the same sign company that manufactured the um, film festival 
banners, so they have experience uh, with our particular um, banners. Currently, there are only banners up for the month of March for the film festival. These will be in the same locations, 30 um, locations. They'll um, be printed on both sides. They're on UV protected uh, heavy vinyl signage that's intended to last for several years and be um, stay out year round with only mild fading of the coloring. Um, and they were again designed to utilize uh, some of the same uh, brand elements that you've seen in other places. Um, the same font that you saw in the gateway sign um, in, in letter B, you'll see that same um, abstract um, art from Montpelier Live logo. Um, and uh, there would be extra signs purchased um, as backup if there were any damage to any of the existing signs. Um, in terms of the mounting, they will go on the existing brackets um, and they're compatible with the, the existing brackets in terms of wind, you know, all of the concerns that you might have in terms of wind and so on and so forth. So what are they dimensionally? They are 60, gosh. 26 by 60 inches. Thank you. With um, uh, some additional uh, bleeds at the top for the, um, where the bra uh, bracket comes out. So I think they're actually 64 inches printed tall. For the wraparound. Correct. Yeah. And sorry, I don't usually ask questions, but are we doing? Are you doing all four different yes. types? So it would be the four types, um, and they would be alternating throughout town. The idea being that there would not be two of the same next to each other, so to speak. I, it's fine with me. I've said <laughs> enough on the others. <laughs> <laughs> I want. I think these are mostly great also. My only question is how much time, if people spent time aligning the letters, it just feels, I like the way the M and the N relate, the, but to keep that strong vertical line of the M, the N, the P, and the I, like the I being shifted over, like it feels like things could be, I realize maybe somebody did all that and chose not to, I don't know, but. And they thought of doing a vertical, my peel your up and down or something similar to your gateway sign. Yeah, so the gateway sign had originally been designed actually to look more similar to these banners, but there was concern about the, um, the readability on that sign in particular because of, as you're passing it in a vehicle, you need to read it more quickly perhaps than if you're a pedestrian, and then these are more artistic sort of pieces. Um, that's not to say that it's not possible. Um, I will say that we're hoping to expedite the project because this has been something, these in particular have been something that's been talked about for quite a long time and there's um, been some desire from city council and other parties that they go up yep. as soon as possible. Yep. And you said they'd last for two or three years or four years? That's the idea and we are planning to purchase um, right now one extra of each uh, sign um, as possible replacements but they are not um, particularly expensive, so if there was a need at any point to purchase more for replacement, that could certainly yeah, happen. And, yeah. and obviously in four years, there may be I'm another set of signs. Assuming the bottoms are secured, too. That yes, there are existing yeah. brackets on the light pole that are on the top and the bottom of the, and there's pole pockets that will be incorporated into the banner. So this will change over time, is what you're saying? Um, the idea is that this would be the primary design for as long as they last, um, and that Certainly, it could. Yes, there were there were some other designs also, um, design that we um, could use in the future. We wanted to keep it fresh. Um, the idea would still be to incorporate the language that you see in the wayfinding signage. Okay. Well, without any more anything more specific than that, there's really nothing that we can evaluate based on the criteria we have. Okay. So, we'll just again that was an informal. So you got some of the feedback. Great. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate your feedback. You and I, we do hope again, to incorporate what we can. And please, there's there's not keep in touch. Yeah. Thank you. Specific to you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Was Salon coming back or no? Or uh, no. Uh, she and she can't make it for the fifteenth, so she'll come on the fifth, oh November fifth. <laughs> Poor people. I can't get their sign. 
Uh, she said that she thought she was going to be scheduled for November 1st anyway. Oh, okay. So. All right. Okay. The next project on the agenda is for 100 State Street. Come forward. Sorry, we didn't give you guys much time, oh, but no, nope, he's going to need that. We'll do that. Do Don't the best do we can <laughs> with what we've got. Here I am. I'm so helpful. <laughs> Okay, I don't know what you just did. <laughs> you know what you do when it says that? Mm. <laughs> um. Shucks. Sorry. Do you want to do that anymore? Yeah. Definitely do. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I know that there are some new members of this board, I believe, from uh, starting this year. This is a um, kind of complicated thing to understand, so I'll try to help explain it. Greg, like, okay. can you introduce yourself first, okay. just for the record? Uh, for the record, my name is Greg Rabido from Rabido Architects. I'm the project architect and uh, represented uh, by um, Civil Engineering Associates, our project civil engineer, Wagner Hodgson, our landscape architects. Uh, we also have Dubois and King, who was the civil engineer for the uh, hotel project next door. And um, resource systems groups, our traffic consultants, Simon's engineer, our, our uh, structural engineer for the parking garage. Uh, last year, uh, and um, spilling into this year, we went through a permit process for an 84-room hotel and 220 space parking garage. Um, this this is the uh, proposed Hampton Inn building here. And adjacent to that, we, uh, uh, through this and other boards, received approvals for a 220 space parking garage that uh, essentially extended to about where this dark banding of contours runs through the, uh, through the building footprint now. Uh, after a lot of back and forth between uh, the, the original applicant and the city, the city determined that they would like to uh, take over the garage portion of this project and expand it to provide more capacity. And so the application in front of you tonight is uh, going to is part of several things. Um, 
One is we're going to create a subdivision so that the lot that the garage sits on will be subdivided from the uh, parcel uh, that currently holds the uh, Capitol Plaza and the, and the approved Hampton Inn. Um, we're also going to have to amend the uh, permit for the Hampton Inn slash Capitol Plaza to allow for off-site parking as, as parking will be provided, continue to be parking in this garage. And uh, we're going to have site plan review and approval for the garage as it is now designed. Um, my, uh, my hope is that we can uh, spend a little time talking about the design, but essentially we took the design that was previously approved, which was a combination of masonry and green screen walls and some other things, we took that same format and extended it uh, to the east so that the uh, overall building dimension is now 208, I believe, by uh, 115. It's, uh, it's 40, 50 feet longer than it used to be. And that will take us up to uh, a, a, at least 348 parking spaces in the parking garage, which you see here. Um, the parking garage will rest in part on, on what's currently called the Haney Lot, lands belonging to uh, Mary Haney, uh, that the city has a long-term lease on. On uh, the back half of that Haney Lot, uh, you can see here the garage spills over that. Can you, can you zoom in, please? Uh, if I can, yeah. So here we are, the immediate context around the uh, garage itself, which is our primary focus this evening. At the bottom of the page, you can see both the Central Vermont Railroad uh, uh, bridge and the proposed bike path bridge and the associated approaches with that. Uh, those, um, uh, those approaches impact this project site right here where, they, where the bike path lands on the far end of the bridge and then transfers over to what will become Confluence Park. Um, I know you guys are probably aware that uh, uh, this area is being examined for um, for the creation of a public park, and we're hoping to evolve the design of the garage to sort of act as an appropriate sort of backdrop to that. And um, so there is that. Other important features around here, obviously, the north branch of the Winooski River, uh, which you can see here, uh, the uh, the main channel of the Winooski River just down here at the bottom of the page. <laughs> and uh, also this building here, Overlook Associates owns a building here, which is a, it's a little garage building. Um, and so their property line is there. And they have a little parking lot behind that they have a deeded right to continue accessing that. So you can see the driveway that's coming down here along this side of the property is intended to provide that deeded access. Where is the space between? Um, we wanted to be 20 feet away from the existing building or more, so at the near point, that's 20 feet. Uh, there's an additional 20-foot setback from the top bank of the river, and that's what this heavy dotted line indicates here. Although, for practical purposes, it's just this portion of it right here on a project site. Um, so we've maintained a paved access to that. Otherwise, we're showing pavement removed, and this is, this is uh, green space here. Um, Another critical piece of this that everybody wants to understand is this, that there is a uh, previously approved, the plan had a uh, walkway access that came down between the hotel and the proposed garage and continued eastward to the bike path. That will remain as originally approved and designed. Um, I think what's going to be different is along the northbound side of that bike path for a little bit, there's going to be a, 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 a sort of small bit of retaining wall so that we, we can have this ground floor open to natural grade outside. Um, and that's for, for both uh, to try to comply generally with the design guidelines in, in the regs, although I'm told they don't strictly apply. We're using those as a sort of go-by to facilitate discussion. And it's also a part of our flood, flood water planning, which is an important part of this design. And this was not me. <laughs> I was, yeah, I'm trying to get back to my zip drive here. Okay. What about the height relationship between the garage and that existing building? Well, I'm going to bring up an image that hopefully shows. Elevation. Well, we did a couple of visual analyses just today. Oh, boy. 
doesn't want to open a JPEG, I guess I'll open it in paint. Paint 3D has got to be able to do this. Yeah, it's just... So, Greg, if you could make sure to send these to me tonight yes. or tomorrow morning so I can put them in for the yes. record, that would be great. myself. Um, if I could figure out how to zoom. Maybe for the plus, plus side. Yep, that would be obvious. Okay, so here you can see the approved Capitol Plaza. This, this tiny bit of, of uh, brick sticking up here is actually the uh, original Capitol Plaza, the six-story portion where the bank is. And then you can see down here, this, this is all part of the garage. A little bit of green wall. There's the bridge from the railroad going over. Um, it came up at the last city council meeting that uh, somebody wanted to see this set of relationships, so we prepared this for that purpose. Um, and I don't know why I scribbled all over it. I just won't save it when I close it. Um, I'm a little slow here because it's not my uh, yeah. it's not my rig. I think you're doing great uh, for driving somebody else's rig. And I think uh, well across the bridge. I don't know if I'm looking for here. Bear with me. I'm just really slow. I'm so used to using a mouse. So here you can see on the cover sheet our basic proposal for this for this garage. As before, we have these masonry blocks, uh, and in accordance with the sort of design standards in the regs, there's a, uh, a first floor, a open first floor, some kind of strong banding up between the first and second floors, a uh, sort of body of the building, and then at the top you see is an uh, indication of a strong cornice. What we changed from the original design is we're using the green walls as sort of spacers so that any one chunk of the facade is only about 42 feet long. And the idea is to, uh, is to sort of give the impression of a solid, a green space, a solid, and another green space. And then each of these solids is slightly different than the others. Um, in, the, in the case on the corner here, you can see that that element we've been talking about before, that that sculptural element is still there, although the, I don't know why the tubing's all black. Um, also, you know, daylighting going into the stairwells, and then the stairwells are capped off at the very top by these glass elements. Um, City Council challenged us to come up with a little more creative way to cap these off, and I do have some drawings showing how we would do that. Um, but this is a good. Uh, and the arch? I don't remember that from the last time. Nope, the arch is also a new thing. Um, yeah, I'm trying to move around and not have a bunch of luck. Here we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so at the, at the base of one of these solid masses facing the, facing the park is this sort of monumental scale arch on the first floor. This, this wall would be granite with string trims at the top, and of course, you know, there'd be granite uh, coursing uh, cut into a trim piece to go around the arch. And then what you're seeing up here are three large, uh, what, what on the architectural drawings would be blank spaces intended to receive public art. Nice. And this is an outcome of our conversation with the city council uh, and some of the members of the public who, uh, you know, I want to make sure this thing has, has a, an appropriately Montpelier-like personality. And I think one thing we see is, is Montpelier's role as a major arts community. And the opportunity here for us to engage the broader public um, by creating opportunities on the building for some major art. So each of these panels is roughly uh, two stories tall and about 12 feet wide to give you an idea how big they are. I, I was wondering why you didn't do something like this on the other side of the building. This is more, this is really visible from cars going by on. Right. Um, well, I, I, I wouldn't preclude the introduction of other art in other places. I think, I think first of all, we, we, we're recognizing the, the, the significant importance of the south elevation as the backdrop to Confluence Park. 
but also as the side that's really going to be the most visible from off site. Um, when we go to the flip around to the north side, um, apart from the little bit that's visible from the gap in State Street, uh, the rest of this is going to be sort of facing, hopefully, ultimately someday, this the uh, Christ Church's uh, housing project. So, you know, I, I mean, I, well, I, I'm thinking the gap you see through as you come in. Right. Well, we'll State look at Street. all four elevations if you wish, and we can talk about where where other art might happen. We still continue the sculptural element, elements. Um, I just don't know if if art on that scale works in the kind of intimate space that the uh, that, that's going to result between that and well, proposed. It wouldn't have though. to be the scale, but right. But additional art is a great yeah. idea, and we're you know we're looking for opportunities for that to happen um, throughout uh, throughout the design. Um, the ground floor, the floor that's uh, is essentially at grade, is is at roughly 518, 519. It's it's set in there flat so that it can be used as parking space, but it could also be used for functions as well. Um, an extension of the farmers market is something that's been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, that's a policy level discussion that the city has to have about how they want to operate this thing. And, whether or not they want to give up income from from things like you know emptying the first floor of the garage out for an event, um, but I think there was a strong desire as we went to talk to the city council to look for ways in which to to provide alternative you know uh, ways of using this thing, and this is a this is sort of a compromise uh, uh, version of that. Could, could you explain the arch piece a little bit more? Is it it's open to behind or what? what it's open to the deck behind. So what is What's going on here? So that is a security grill that. Uh, um, and this is the deck here. Yeah, you're seeing okay. the parking ramping going on in the far distance behind. Um, there's there's one thing we we want to sort of make clear as we're doing this is the ground floor wants to be open because your zoning regs can when they talk about design control and I know this doesn't really apply to this particular parcel but, but we're gonna we're gonna use that as a go by. Um, you know, they talk about the ground floor being open to the, to the to the pedestrian environment, and you know, some sense of stuff happening at the ground level. We want that to happen. At the same time, we want flood water, if it ever does come here, to uh, be able to flow in and then flow back out unimpeded. So those large op openings provide the kind of visual uh, um, impact that the that the, uh, the land use regulations are suggesting. But they also help us solve the technical problem with the, uh, with the flood water arrangement. I don't really understand why. What, did you look at other openings rather than arched for this piece? Uh, I, I didn't. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. I, I think it came about because there was discussion amongst the various city council members about how they really they liked that form. And they, you know, so I took that as direction from my client to explore it. Um, I, th I think that it has to be appreciated that uh, that, that element is going to be viewed most typically from a couple hundred feet away, and so I wanted the the art, but also the context of the art, this the, the facade treatment, uh, to be a fairly simple um, and and pretty heroic or monumental scale. And that I wanted I wanted a big element that read from a distance. And these are just going to be panels of some kind that can. Art can be added to. Well, I, 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 if you're talking about where I'm showing the art above, yeah. Well, you know, we would white panels or whatever. Yeah, yeah we we'd probably do a, like a some kind of exterior grade level five stucco finish over a over a panel so that so it can be painted on. Um, you know, we wouldn't want something with a lot of lines going through it because you know, right, presumably right. the art would provide that that interest. Um, but um, I, I, the banding, the light-colored banding you see going through the masonry was intended to be granite or cut stone, and, and um, you know we, we wanted at least one or two places on the building where where there's some real exposition of stone, since it's such an integral part of Montpelier's history for sure, Vermont history in, in general. And, um, so we were looking for a significant statement in granite, and I don't know, I like the arch form, but. Do you have concerns about it, or is it just? I, I just, I don't think it's the right language, personally. Um, 
I understand wanting to, to be monumental, to read monumental, yep. and I understand what an arch conveys, <coughs> but um, in this case, I don't think it really jibes well with the rest of the language of the building. Okay. All the rectilinear yeah. shapes and forms yeah. and throwing one random curve in there. So uh, the question yeah. is, has anything else been explored? Uh, for, for shapes on that? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I, I mean, I, when I first sat down to compose that one panel, I, you know, I was looking for some variety in these panels so they didn't read as all the same thing. Um, if, you, if you want me to give that some more careful consideration, I'm happy to do that before I come back again. Um, but uh, I think that the, the, the choice of the granite and the sort of openness of it are things that would probably yeah, stick. no, I think that those Absolutely. are good features. So, um, and... Uh, is that going to be a, a real arch with the the stones? Yeah, I expect it would be. We'd, we'd have to build a false work. I can't it. see well enough to see the differentiation. Well, in the modeling, you know, you're probably just going to see a mapped on texture yeah, at this point. But I think it would be, if you do the arch, I think it would be really good to have it look like an effective arch. Right. Mm. This doesn't look like an effective arch. Because the trim isn't the trim is yeah, because yeah. it's a facade, it looks it's not gonna fall off, but it wouldn't wouldn't work if you tried to build a wall this way. Yeah. Okay. I uh, I appreciate that. I think if we're gonna make the gesture it ought to work like a real arch. Um, I just I think the rendering doesn't illustrate the pieces it would take to do that, but right. but as the drawings yeah. reach completion, we can make sure that gets included in there, right? It sounds like I need to look at that whole element. Well, plus, it, it looks thin as well. Uh, yeah, and that's 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 probably uh, a rendering expedient. Um, but as as the drawings develop, we can we can address that concern. Um, I'm gonna try to. What is the difference in height elevation of this building as opposed to the first one proposed? Not in exclusive of the towers, but just the main structure. Uh, there's really no change in the, the basic datum elevations. Uh, the top of it is going to come up to about the top of the fourth floor on the hotel. Uh, if the big difference in terms of ex is how much of the ground floor is exposed, which yes. more is exposed than it had previously been shown. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that was that was primarily to sort of create this ground floor with active openings, but also right. again to address the storm the storm drainage issue. So, um, so again, the top of the structure exclusive of the towers is essentially the same as it was not before. Changed. Yeah, we okay. still zigzag back and forth four total levels, but they're they're split 50-50 because it's a it's a switchback ramp. The ramps. Yeah, the end the end bays. Our, our level, and then the, the uh, three large center bays are, are where the floors are sloping. Um, there are some other uh, changes to the elevations. I'm sorry. I think I can, should be able to do this. Yeah, you can see how the floor plates switch back and forth. Yeah, and that's, I didn't include that in their packets because it's not really the yeah. design review. Well, I just thought this this might have a couple of numbers on it to answer mm. Eric's question. Yeah, they have the elevations. So this is a net add of how many spaces? We went from 220 to 348. The level in relation to the hotel has not changed, though, the top. No, and I, I have an image that helps explain that. I'm just going to bring that up, Eric. Okay, so this image here is helpful to kind of explain the relationship. You can see the hotel in the background, and that the um, you know 42-inch wall at the top, this that, that highest level landing there, 
is uh, looking right over the top of that to the windowsill elevation on the fourth floor. So those floors are almost, they're within a couple of inches of each other. The fourth floor of the garage is essentially the same as the fourth floor of the hotel. And then it's all sloping downhill at a relatively modest slope of like 3.6%. It all slopes down and winds its way into the ground. And um, you can see here that the only parts that stick up above those nominal elevations are the top of the stair towers. And this one here, which is actually the, both the exit stair and the elevator, and that's why it's a little bit taller. It's got the uh, uh, shaft extension that you're supposed to have. And you can see how far back this panel drops. I mean, there's a, there's a almost nine foot reveal on that first break, and then you get a little green wall coming around the corner. You have this, uh, the, the panel with the arch and the art, and another green panel. And the actual construction drawings that are included in the application package show that there are a series of kind of interesting, playful, circular holes cut into the fabric of this green screen to provide just the occasional unexpected view out. Um, subsequent issue, subsequent uh, additions of these renderings will include that. You know, it's just we have to do a little more careful mapping before we can make the texture turn out right. Um, and that's doable because this is a pod system. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a modular. It's a modular matrix. This uh, green wall screen or green screen system. Um, you know, we'll just shop modify it to to cut some holes in the panels and trace around. Or a bent metal edging. Um, I don't know that, that that's the big overview. Um, I perhaps ought to let you guys ask me questions and direct me to things you want to see because there's there's more than I think you know we have to be out of here at like seven, don't we? Yeah, yes. we've done 10 seconds. Unfortunately, we've <laughs> run, so, out of, run out of time, and I'm sorry that we had a, a larger than expected earlier project to deal with. So we, no, I, I, fortunately, I, and there's some people who are interested in making some public content uh, comment as well, and we'd like to give them a chance to to contribute. Yes. So if you wouldn't mind... <laughs> We'd love to have you come back to the next meeting if that's possible. Uh, yeah, that's that would be delightful. I, I, I didn't want to spring this on you and ask for a vote anyhow. I, I didn't want to get any of the preliminary comments you had, uh, and I have gotten some useful things that I can take action on. But um, we would very much appreciate being continued to the next hearing, and we can talk more about utilities and stuff at that time. I do have information about lighting and all of that as well. But um, since we're out of time for that tonight, we'll just. Thank you for getting caught up and expect to see you a lot in the future. Thank you very, very much. Thanks. We appreciate it.